information retrieval journal. His research interests include digital library, uh, applied natural language processing, and information retrieval. Then he is recognized as a distinguished speaker by the ACM for natural language processing and digital library research. Okay, so without further delay, let's uh, welcome me to give this uh, interesting title. Yeah, please. Excellent introduction. Um, do I need a microphone? Because I had to operate the computer, so I'd rather not. I don't? Oh, yeah, I do. Okay. I do need to go. Okay. So I'm going to be giving a talk that's a little bit different than one on schedule because uh, I found the title not quite good. Actually, Kishiloi should be standing here and giving this talk because this is all his work. Uh, but uh, I thought, you know, because Prof Cha asked me to present, I don't want to put Kishiloi on the spot. So. Uh, uh, the good thing is that uh, he's in big here because he is on the job market. So I've heard a couple of you ask, can we find good AI talent here? So uh, Kishiloi and his uh, compatriots, Lahari, who's actually his wife, uh, as well as Kaz, who's our, our former uh, research fellow at uh, uh, NII in uh, Japan, have been collaborating on this work. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about a, a slightly different topic, which is about online discussion forums. So we all use these. We, we use Reddit. Uh, you know, Coursera uh, is a MOOC, but uh, we also use it in health information. I mean, this session is about health after all, right? So, um, what do we do when we go to online discussion forums, right? Um, you know, in in uh, in Singapore, we complain a lot, right? We have NUS whispers and all of these other things where we talk about gossip, all right, and hardware zone and things like that. But you know, occasionally we actually do something useful and, and look at for information, right? So users ask questions. They share anecdotal observations, and sometimes people are nice, they actually reply with useful information, right? So, um, you know, what might we do on health-related uh, queries, right? So, uh, here's an example. Uh, my 82-year-old dad was diagnosed yesterday with moderate Alzheimer's. I know that, that denial goes along with this for family members, but we are scratching our heads every day at the diagnosis. So, this is just one of many typical posts that you can find out there. Just to illustrate the problem setup that we have, so we are, we might have people reply to that. Uh, they might have different levels of seniority on the forum, etc. We might have uh, uh, different places like the, the join date, um, etc. Over here and uh, their location, how many posts they have. Okay, but aside from that, you, you see other replies, right? So the basic structure is you have a thread with a number of posts and a number of users going to talk about this, right? So the problem is, you know, when you look at the discussion forum, how are they ordered? They're ordered by recency, right? And you have to think, does that actually make sense? Sometimes, you know, there are certain threads that are really useful to find, but because they were posted a while ago, we can't find them anymore, all right? So um, in, in uh, for example, in a massive online open course, uh, Andrew Ung remarked one time, you know, I. I started the machine learning course, and there are 100,000 participants. Every time I look at the forum, it's completely different. I have no idea what's going on. So we need forum triage and other uh, natural language techniques to try to address these issues. Right? Okay. So there are lots of challenges, right? There are a large number of users, <coughs> threads, discussion topics. They're sometimes not very well structured. Well, they they have some structure. They have headings and things, but they're mostly <coughs> unstructured text. There's a long trail of posts inside. Usually, there's it's not very hierarchical. It's just like there's a thread title, and then there's a lot of things in the middle. And there's a continuous influx of friends if you're a successful e-commerce engine or a successful startup that's uh, uh, managing this information source. Okay, so how do we address it? We can address it with medication like we do for Western medicine, but maybe we want to be more proactive about it and think about how we can help users navigate these discussion forums. So I would like to think of it as preventive medicine in terms of, you know, vegetables, right? Eat your vegetables every day, you don't get sick, you don't need medicine. But maybe, you know, in the sense of discussion forums, maybe we can find natural language pro uh, processing solutions to address this. Okay, so I'm going to talk about three of Kishloy's works. Um, they're all published. Uh, well, one almost published. Um, so, uh, so we're going to start with this one uh, about matching users' interests. Okay, so pretend 
uh, we have a, number, a bunch of users and threads, and of course we have uh, users that consume some threads. Okay, and we want to know, oh, is this uh, orange user here interested in this thread, right? This is the typical recommendation systems problem, right? So the potential benefits is if I have a recommendation system in a discussion forum engine, I can potentially have better visibility of threads. I first of all don't need to waste your time reading things that are just recently updated. Right? I can give you the things that you actually want to read. I can improve the quality of responses because now I can associate that you might be very interested in participating on this thread because you have this ailment, you have this interest, you've done this treatment before, and I have a reduced latency for responses. So if somebody asks a question about ALS or Alzheimer's, then I can get a response right away because I can target the users that are interested in that particular part of the forum. Right? So for example, I have some uh, post tests here. You know, is anyone experiencing lower back pain while standing up for a little while? And, and there's another post here. My lower back and hip pains a lot. It even hurts to walk some days. Okay? Are these two related? What do you think? Same condition or not? No. no. Not related. Okay. One is with ALS, one is Parkinson's. Okay, these are slightly related, but they are different associated conditions. How do you think a machine learning system or NLP system would treat them? Well, they have the same words, right? No, no matter whether you use word embeddings or not, maybe you can get a little fancy with verb or Elmo and you have contextualized word embeddings, but for the most part, these are separate conditions, even though they manifest in the same symptoms. Okay, that's a problem. What's worse is that there are different treatments for these diseases, right? If you recognize it as ALS, then you would say, oh, you know, you have fatigue or stiffness, and the way you treat those two different symptoms are different. You can't use the same medication for it, right? Parkinson's, you can use medication. ALS, probably not. Okay, you have to resort to other types of therapy, right? Okay, so what can we get? We have this problem. You can see in the red, these are lexically similar posts. They're using the same words, okay? But they're associated with very different conditions and substantially different treatments, right? And what's worse is, you know, even users can declare what their interests are. They can say, I have Alzheimer's, I have Parkinson's, or whatever, but not everyone does that. You know, they're not always complete, and so we have this problem where even or even if you have the facility to offer a profile, it's usually not complete. Okay, and so this comes to this very key part in health, where intercondition similarity, right? Same words, different meaning, different conditions, different <laughs> treatment. Oh boy, that sounds Trump. Okay, well, you know that's not the only problem. If that was only the problem, we may not have been able to get uh, uh, Keish Lloyd to finish his PhD. Uh, but there are more problems, as you know, right? So we can say, all right, so we have these two things that have been suffering from back pain. Put weight on the right leg. I got a lot of cramps in my legs, and I put my body weight on it to stand up. Okay? But these are different symptoms, too. Okay? So they can be lexically similar posts. Even in the same condition, okay, this one again is with ALS, okay? This is the same uh, condition, but different associated symptom, right? So they're commonly affected body parts, gets associated with different symptoms. Ah, oh no, we got more problems. Intra condition similarity, okay? Our vocabulary is really out to get us. All right. What can we do? Well, we thought we would try to address this in a two-stage probabilistic framework. We're going to propose a topic model that has an extra variable called an interest. Okay. And we have another way of using that topic model in a CTR-like model. CTR is collaborative topic regression. Okay. I'm not going to paint out all the math for this, but I'm going to give you some idea, okay? So we're going to develop it from a scratch. So an interest of where topic model, if you know topic models, it's a generative framework. Okay? It's a generative story. So um, basically, we're going to say that it has some self-reported interests, okay? Uh, we're going to say interest is sort of a general idea that you could apply to many areas, 
but in the domain of health, we're going to call these health conditions. You can think of a condition-aware topic model or disease-aware topic model, okay? And then within those particular diseases or conditions, we have latent topics, okay? And then we could observe this, in not diseases, but uh, in Quora, you know, in politics, you might be a Democrat or Republican or Tory or, uh, you know, other, other uh, political parties. In sports, you may be interested in different teams and movies, different directors and actors, okay? So all these types of discussion forms, they always have some type of latent structure in what people are interested in, right? So we're going to model that. Even in, in, in Stack Overflow, you can think about the programming languages or operating systems that underlie what types of interests you have. And then those reported interests may be incomplete. Maybe in your profile in Stack Overflow, you say that you know Java, but actually because you created your profile years ago, you actually know Python and a couple other languages as well. Okay, so we can actually infer some of these interests like, uh, by people's interactions. So if I say I only know Java in my user profile, but I'm interacting on a lot of Scala and um, Python posts, then I can infer, hey, maybe you know Scala, maybe you know Python, okay? And complete your user profile. So, for example, this person you want has interacted with diabetes, pancreatitis, uh, diabetes, and, and other topics, and maybe they never said they were interested in diabetes, but we can infer that, right? That's very easy to do, okay? So our IATM is thus a generative model that takes us inputs, all three types of information, okay? A user's profile, which may be incomplete, okay? A FRED document that has all these posts in it, and user-reported conditions or, or interests, okay? And we output uh, this type of generative probabilistic model for user interest topic distributions, okay? And also the FRED one. So uh, both of these are, are parallel sides of this mirror. Okay, so let's give you the generative story for this model. It's actually fairly simple. Okay, if you're aware of topic uh, model notation, it's very simple. If you don't, just play along and pretend that you do, because sometimes I don't even know what I'm talking about either. Okay, so let's say we have a, a click for documents, right, D. Uh, so we have, are going to say we have a latent, uh, unobserved variable for the set of interests that are in the topic, and uh, we can see the words in the document, okay? And we're going to say that we're going to have a, an interest that is generating that word. This is the normal topic model, but we're going to say it's also contingent on two other pieces of information. Okay, a distribution of how users uh, form with topics, as well as how the threads demonstrate interest in a particular interest. Okay, and these three all together jointly generate the topic for the word, which in turn generates the word. Of course, the word is also conditioned on the global model. Uh, of what types of words and interests and topics go together. So we're going to infer all of these latent variables uh, from the model, okay? So uh, the key part of this is that uh, when we are trying to uh, address this intertopic similarity problem, we are creating two types of distributions, right? First is this distribution about how interested users are with specific types of interests. Again, here, interests are medical conditions, right? So you have this, um, this part here that says this person is mostly interested in diabetes and high blood pressure, but even within each particular condition, we have a distribution of topics. So within diabetes, this particular user is interested in topic one or topic two. And same over here for friends. Okay? So getting these two, two level distributional uh, outputs as part of the IATM model. Okay, so that was the first part. That introduces how we are addressing inter-condition similarity. Okay? How do we address the intra-similarity? Okay? So we're going to use CTR. But it's going to be a slightly different version of CTR. So this is collaborative topic regression that was started in 2011, okay? And uh, the thing about CTR is it works really well when you only have one latent type of factor, which might be for an item, okay? But in recommender systems, always we have users plus items, right? So there are two things to model. So that's really easy to take care of. We're going to measure that uh, by trying to capture both user and thread latent models. So we have 
uh, basically added an additional plate, this red plate here, which overlaps with our black plate in terms of our Bayesian modeling, right, our topic modeling. So we're going to say that rating, right, which is our observed variable, is conditioned on both information from the FRED, which is normal CTR, as well as the user topic distribution, which comes from our JNCTR, Joint Normalized CTR. Okay, so this is addressing the intrust condition similarity, and basically we're pairing it with the generative topic model that you saw on the previous slide that is latent on interests. Okay, so we're trying to discover uh, what types of uh, probability distributions are specific within an interest within a thread and user topic orientation. Okay. So uh, we actually did this on uh, this type of experiment on a data set. This is coming from HealthWords, which is uh, where the example that I showed you earlier was drawn from. Okay, And we're not looking at generic categories which aren't condition specific. So things like family support and healthcare in general, we're not looking at those. We're looking at the condition specific uh, uh, discussion boards. Okay. And uh, we're going to compare against some baselines, okay? Uh, NMF, which is very famous, right? A factorization model, okay? It handles user to FRED interaction, okay? Up here. If you've also heard of topic models, I'm sure you've heard of the offer topic model that, uh, of course, takes care of this type of thing where you have the offer and the topic, right? The FREDs. So these two pieces of information, okay? CTR and context aware recommender deal with uh, deal with those other types of information, okay? But our methods, uh, especially the IMT, IATM, the interest offer topic model, interest aware topic model, and JNCTR coupled together handle all four types of input information, okay? So that's the, the novel edge of, of what we're doing here, okay? So let's take a look at some experimental results. This is the case where we're talking about in-matrix prediction. In-matrix prediction just basically means that every <coughs> user or every friend was observed at the training time so that it can be reflected in the test. So this is the easy situation. It looks a little bit like this. I have a number of friends. I have a number of users. I'm just trying to predict within this matrix whether some particular held out part is a plus or a minus or a check or an X. Okay. And so you can see the results for this model. Not so surprisingly, otherwise I wouldn't be standing here giving this talk. Our model does better. Okay. <laughs> but why does it do better? Uh, very interestingly, you know, if, if you look at uh, either of these models, IATM uh, or uh, the offer topic model by themselves, they're all down here. Right? It's really that addition of this extra tuning factor, the JNCTR, that's getting us the coverage um, that is helping in the recall boost. Okay? So that's a very important model. Okay? Now you may be saying, well, man, that's too easy. This is in-matrix prediction. You already have the threads. You've already seen the users. What about that famous problem in recommendation systems called cold start? Right? <laughs> so cold start is out of matrix prediction. It just means, for example, I've never seen this thread before. Okay, newly created by a person. Can you recommend it to me? Uh, I don't know. Can I? Sure. All right. Some of our baselines don't work. Okay. Of course, our model has to be able to work. Otherwise, again, I wouldn't be standing here giving you this presentation. It happens to do fairly well on this. Okay. What about the case of a new user? So I've just joined your system. I've just you know, signed the form and, and signed off on whatever uh, user agreement without reading it, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. OK, can you recommend things to me? Oh, yeah, sure, I can do that too. And um, you know, I can do it well enough that it beats the baselines too. Okay. So uh, what we're trying to say is that uh, Baseline models, especially matrix factorization, suffers a lot from cold start. There's many people in this room who've addressed this. Okay, we are trying to do it by using extra contextual information that allows us to model and uh, get at uh, recommending users to friends or friends to users. Either way you look at it, by using extra information that's out of the normal cycle. Okay, so this was all about topic models, right? <coughs> what are topic models good for, anyways? 
right? They're supposed to model topics, right? So, um, you know, Wendy has been eccentric. Where's the people? Okay, so I'm gonna address that, all right? Okay, so one part is like, can we look and see whether the conditions that we have are being recovered properly by our topic model, okay? So for example, if I log into your system, I've never told you anything about me, okay? And this is true for a lot of people, okay? Can you give me a good recommendation? 13% of the users on our data set don't tell us anything about themselves, okay? But they do participate in the forum. Like I told you before, we can probably infer what they are interested in, even if they don't tell us, okay? So how do we do this? Well, what we do is we're gonna try by simulating. We're going to kill off some of the purported conditions Restricted and see whether we can recover that information. Okay, so if let's say you know my mother who's uh, suffering from diabetes, uh, she reports herself as saying but she's diabetic. But in my experiment, I removed that. I want to see whether I can recover it. So she would be in this case of one of the people who is uh, uh, reporting only one condition. Okay, so here you go. How much can we recover? We can recover quite a lot, right? So you can see here if you. Uh, held out one of the conditions that our user reports, we can recover that condition 64% of the time just based on your forum participation. Okay? And 39% of the time, even though I remove three of the conditions that you say you have, I can infer them back 39% of the time with my topic model. So yes. Okay. All right, the other part that I wanted to ask you, because this is a participatory lecture, I'm a lecturer, okay? So I want to ask you, make sense of the topic models, okay? There are five columns here. They are due to five different diseases, okay? Or conditions or interests or whatever you want. Do you see anything interesting about them? any one of these, okay? Can you tell me, hmm, okay, I want you to concentrate. Which one of these is a terminal condition? Is it column one? Column two? Four. Why? Yes. Right. Okay. Very interesting, right? Our topic models are recovering useful information, right? We can say that. In the case of terminal diseases, people are not just going there, as we know, for health information. They're going there for emotional support. Okay? I would love to talk to anyone with ovarian cancer. really believe that faith can play a huge role in recovering and also positive attitude. I wish this disease didn't exist. Right? This is telling us that health forums are not just to get information. They're there for social support. We actually know this in the literature, it's been said many times before, but we can recover it also in our computational models. Okay. All right, I am going to accelerate a little bit because we are running out of time. So I'm going to talk about another way of thinking about health forums, okay? Handling new threads. Okay, so we already talked about code star recommendation, okay? So what more can we do with it? Right? What we want to do is, again, recommend new threads to potentially interested users, right? So how can we do that? Maybe we can think, again, we have a new user. This is, again, the same case of a unseen thread. We need to give it to a bunch of users, okay? What could we do here? Well, again, if we look at the matrix factorization approach, we multiply two of these things together, an IF user and JF user, uh, and we do a multiplication and we need to make the recommendation based on that. Okay? So, one thing we can try to do is imagine it as a classification task. That's so, so strange, right? What do we mean by a classification? We mean that all of the existing users, let's say I'm on, uh, I don't know, Stack Overflow, I've got a million users, okay? Each user is a class label, okay? That means if I treat it as a Supervised classification, I have a million labels to predict, okay? So what I want to do is say, here comes a new thread thing, it just came in, who does it go to? Who do I recommend it to? That's a supervised classification task. 
a thousand classes, and I can classify it to multiple people, right? So it's a multi-label classification task, okay? Extreme multi-label text classification, or XML, as confusing as it sounds, okay? So we're going to say, I have a new thread. I'm going to take this black box, and I'm going to recommend one or zero, whether it gets sent to a user or not, okay? So this is typically used for recommending uh, wiki uh, tags for wiki pages or e-commerce. So like if you think e-commerce, you might have different filters or tags like under $100, uh, hardware, and, uh, sys uh, hardware, or by a certain manufacturer, etc. Those are all different tags that you could think of as labels for such types of problems. Okay, so it's, this is a more general task than just form recommendation, but we're casting it in disguise here. So there are lots of different uh, baselines for it. There are embedding-based techniques, tree-based techniques, and deep learning-based techniques, which are still considered the state of the art even though they're two years old, 24 months old. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the standard deep learning technique of making a neural network to do this. We're going to encode it using a word embedding and a bidirectional GRU. These are pretty standard. I think heard a lot of these uh, things today. And there is one worry that we have is that a universal encoding of the text, that means if you were to represent it as embeddings, it might still not be enough. Why? Because if you think about all the users in the system, they may be thinking about the text with different ideas or different um, a priori interests, right? So if they have different interests to explore, one encoding is not enough. Let's take a look at an example. Let's say there's this gentleman. He's going to post a post online. What does he ask? I've been recommended to undergo a trichotomy and put in a PhD. I'm wondering how many days I'll have to stay in the hospital. Will I have a hard time adjusting afterwards? Does the hose need to be connected while transferring? Will the equipment take a lot of time and room? How would you call for help with this type of device? Who knows what a PEG is? Uh, is this thing. It's a feeding tube. I had to look it up because I have no idea what it is. Okay, It's basically when your mouth is, uh, is not, and your muscles are not able to chew very well or swallow very well, so the doctor puts in a, a feeding tube that goes directly to your stomach. Okay, So this is a real issue that a user had. Right? And you can think, okay, if I had this already done to me, there are certain things that I might be able to advise on. I might uh, address the parts about the blue because I recently had it. I remember the time in the hospital. Maybe if I had it chronically, I would be able to uh, answer the things in the orange. You know, um, and, and as a doctor, maybe I'd be able to advise on the green part. So different people might be able to come to this particular post with different interests. So how do we address that? Well, um, I have to thank uh, Prof. Zhang Min already because he introduced this idea of attention. So that's exactly what we do. We use cluster-sensitive attention. So attention means, of course, that different parts of a post might be attended to differently, right? If I'm interested in one part, I might have different ideas of attention for it. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give weight to words of the post, but I want to do it in such a way that I can do it for every user in my system. So potentially, everywhere here in this room, we have about 100 people in this room, they might have different ideas of which part of that post they're interested in. Okay, that's great. But I can't do that, because if I'm using XMLC, extreme multi-label classification, I cannot make attention vectors for every user in the system. One million different attention layers. Doesn't work. Okay, it won't scale. How do I deal with that? Well, I'm going to hypothesis that I don't need all of these attention layers. I just need enough to capture some latent structure in terms of clusters. Okay. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create uh, a number of k clusters or k layers that are attention layers, and then use that and assign in an end-to-end soft-weighted way um, the weights for these end users. Okay. So the architecture basically looks a little bit like this. This is really messy, but I'll try to lighten it up for you. Over here, we have our standard word embeddings. Here we have a neural net model. This happens to be a bidirectional GRU. Never mind that. Okay. And then somewhere magic happens, and then we get uh, the outputs, which are our binary classifier, uh, uh, whether a thread is recommended to a user.
Okay, so these are all the uh, uh, U users. But in the middle here is the part that's new, is uh, adding the cluster sensitive tension. Okay, so I have K of these layers here, CK, right, which basically uh, is an element wise multiplication layer between the previous uh, output of the uh, by GRU and uh, generating uh, the, the cluster attention uh, for, for those particular words. Okay, so again, we have a number of data sets. The, we have three from health, one from technical domain like Stack Overflow. Okay, and we're going to use a, a recall NDCG and the MRR to uh, measure how well we're doing. Okay, of course, like every other types of recommendation systems work, you can see the sparsity level is well over 99%, meaning that most of the threads have never been seen by the same user. Okay, so for MRR, you can see that uh, our uh, baseline, uh, sorry, our model outperforms all the baselines. Our baselines are uh, a VAE approach, a contextual variational autoencoder, CTR, which we saw in the previous work, uh, our standard uh, text-based uh, CNN, uh, extreme classifier that does uh, CNN, and our model, but without our, our contextual embedding layers, right? Our contextual attention layers. Sorry. Okay. So you can see the right comparison is <coughs> these two columns versus the rest because uh, this is our standard bidirectional GRU, and when we add the context-sensitive attention, uh, cluster-sensitive attention, we get uh, five to six percent better results. When we go to a slightly different uh, measure, uh, way of measuring, we can see also very similar results. Uh, here, I, I want to note one difference that Kishiloi uh, educated me on this afternoon, which is that recall at M here stands for the number of users. So if you think if you have a million users, recall at 100 means recommend the spread to 100 different people. Okay, so normally when you see recall on the recommendation system statements, we call it three or five or ten. Okay, but it wouldn't make sense in this case, right? Because we're recommending this spread for a whole bunch of users. So we call it a hundred or a thousand or ten thousand might be more uh, useful. Okay, so you can take these numbers into account. The the ones with a hundred, uh, like these ones down here, are, are more telling of the performance of the system. Okay, so overall cluster sensitive is uh, effective. So uh, I'm going to run to the last work that we've done, which is identifying helpful posts. Okay, so this gets back to the, the core problem that I noted before is that in cases of very large forums, like uh, in multi, uh, I'm sorry, <coughs> a massive online open courses, when there are so many students, very few uh, faculty, every time you log into the forum, it's like you've been on vacation for three months and you just come back. Like your, your inbox is just completely overloaded, right? So how do you make sense of that? You need triage to do that, okay? So discussion forums and community question answering. Are these the same thing or not? Hands up. You think these are good? Uh, quite similar, right? We have Yahoo Answers or Baizu uh, uh, or other places where you can ask questions and answer them? Are they the same as discussion forums? CQ are very similar, right? Okay. Let's see. Well, in CQA, it happens to be that we have usually have factoid questions or something similar to that. So we get a single correct answer in most of the cases. Okay. But like I've been telling you in discussion forums, they're for discussion, right? I mean, if you have a political debate, is there a right answer? Probably not. Right? Because Tories and, and other folks probably don't get along. Republicans and Democrats never get along. The only thing we all universally know in the USA is everyone hates Trump. Okay? But okay, that's not even true. All right. Yeah. Not, definitely not everyone, right? Actually, the majority still are somewhat convinced that Trump is right. Okay? So that was the political side. Never mind. Let's go back to the, the work. All right. So um, there are lots of personal anecdotes, and there are lots of multiple correct answers on it discussion forum, unlike CQA, okay? And the threads are actually more subjective and open-ended, and you can see this, for example, in something like this. If you look at Reddit and Stack Overflow, you can see the difference, right? Reddit is more of a, a discussion, okay? And Stack Overflow is more uh, uh, a single correct answer. It's a, a technical forum, 
right? So if you look at Reddit, which has a lot of political information, you can see the thread lengths are uh, accordingly a lot longer. You know, it's more discursive. Okay, you're not looking for an informative right answer. Okay, so discussion forums are actually not like question and community question answering. They're quite different from it. And uh, that's why we need to predict helpful posts. There's not actually one correct answer. Okay, so uh, the test is very simple. Identify whether a post is helpful. So you might have, how do you do, do X as your friend starter? Do you really need to use X? No, not very helpful. Uh, sorry, new here, I have no idea. Also not helpful. You know, sure, follow these steps. Yes, that's helpful. And so we'd like to be able to catch that and notify some users that that's actually a good answer. And I can tell you about X, no, okay? So uh, Y, no, yeah. So uh, we're interested in the textual context of the post. There's plenty of other work that's done, okay, by other scholars that are not NLP that are looking at the social networking aspect. So if you look at, you know, uh, <laughs> prestigious posters, etc., prestigious followers, you can also answer this. We're just concerned with the textual information, okay? So uh, we're going to say that helpfulness is any type of user action that uh, indicates that, like upvote or like or mark as helpful or highlighting, okay? So uh, to give you an idea of why that's the case, if you look at this, all right, let's say that I have an original post that says, um, I was working yesterday and my back was bent over, and when I got up, it felt like I strained my back, but now my mind is linking it to my kidney, right? And so the first post is relevant and novel, it's an answer, right? It says, I have this and my doctor has told me it's muscular and physio might help. Is it helpful? Well, yeah, it's sort of helpful. The second post say, kidney pain is usually constant and doesn't change you when you move. Uh, don't worry, you'll be fine. Is it relevant? Is it novel? Yes. So it's helpful? Yes. If it happens only when you move, there's a big chance this muscle spasms. This can happen after physical activities. Actually, the third user is paraphrasing what the second user already said. So in a sense, it's not novel, which is why it's listed as no here. And although if you look at this post by itself, the third post by itself, you might have thought it was helpful. Okay? But actually it's not because the second post, the second reply already subsumes it. Okay? So we're going to make a hypothesis. We're going to say a post is useful if it's relevant to the original post, or the original question, but it also has to introduce some novelty, right? Without novelty, it's redundant. We know in summarization we cast redundant information out. Okay. So we're going to say we have a target post that we, uh, we want to decide whether it's helpful or not. We're going to look at the original post, the thread starter. All of that information has to go to our computation. And we're also going to bring in the past K posts that were in the discussion, like in the last example, uh, answers to one and two, okay? And then we're going to throw this into a textual encoder, and then encode two pieces of information, relevance, which is only looking at the target post and the original post, and of course, if we're thinking of novelty, we need to know what has happened in the past, okay? So we're going to put these two pieces up together, and throw them in uh, into a, a single vector, and then use a, an FC layer, a fully connected layer, to decide helpfulness. That's our model, very simple. Okay, and there are some technical details about how the textual encoder is done. That's this part over here, and the sequence encoder, but these are pretty standard. These are just GRUs with embeddings. Okay, and that's our prediction model. I want to tell you a little bit about this. You can see here the post content is never directly used. That means this piece of information down here, right, is not actually routed all the way uh, uh, given to the classifier here. It has to go through these two separate no uh, layers of relevance and novelty. Otherwise, we may find that there's some popularity bias. We want the language to speak for itself, not all the other attributes. Okay. So this is end-to-end -end trainable, so we do exactly that in a uh, popular ne neural network style. And uh, we've done some experiments. Again, we've done some experiments with Reddit, uh, with uh, threads that are longer than 10, Reddit with threads that are longer than 3 posts, uh, with Coursera, as well as Travel Stack Exchange. Where in Travel Stack Exchange, the questions are just, you know, where do you like to go, what sites do you like to see, so they're quite subjective. Now, there's no one right answer, just like you would see as a difference from Stack Overflow. Okay, 
So there are some baselines. I know it's late, so I'm going to skip a, a, a lot of this. But basically, we've done a relation study, the novelty and the relevance components. Okay, and we use the ground truth being uh, how much of the user feedback has actually said it's helpful or not using the 80th percentile vote on the forum to decide which of the threads are actually uh, uh, sorry, which of the posts are actually helpful and which of the posts are not. Okay. So here's the big result table. Uh, all I want you to really pay attention to is the bottom part of it here. Okay, so uh, you can see uh, that the scores are not very good. It's actually fairly hard to predict uh, helpfulness, as, as you might expect. Our model per, uh, outperforms most of the state of the art. And the ablation study, which are these two rows here, this is our full model in white. And then the relevance models are in orange and uh, uh, blue. So the blue one is just the relevance component. The orange one is the novelty component. You can see that the novelty factor is actually really important. It happens to be uh, the uh, stronger component of the two in determining uh, relevance. Uh, sorry, in determining helpfulness. Uh, okay. So we also looked at the effect of context. Like how much context do you need to be able to, to des decide whether things are relevant or not? So uh, you can see that, not surprisingly, the more context you model, the better your results are. Okay, the uh, accuracy improves sharply from uh, context one through eleven. So short posts really suffer this a lot, but uh, after you get to maybe ten posts or more, then the context sorts of peter out, uh, and that sort of makes sense, right? I mean, if I'm a human user and I read a thread. I'll be able to know whether it's uh, novel, but if there's a hundred posts in this thread, I only have paid attention to the last, you know, couple of posts that have happened. Okay, so that's my entire talk. Thank you for listening. Uh, we've looked at ways of uh, pioneering techniques to help discussion forums uh, users navigate threads. Uh, we talked about really two different parts: thread visibility and uh, thread helpfulness and uh, applicable to many different domains, not just health. Okay, and if you have questions, I will... All the tough questions, you can ask Keisha Lori, all the math. Anything general, I can answer. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think due to time, maybe we need to stop here. Yeah, but we can continue the offline discussion with okay. me, with the student. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So for trying Okay, so thank you for coming. Let's end for today's workshop. Oh, maybe just, yeah. Yeah, so, so tomorrow we start at 9 o'clock. I think uh, tomorrow we'll do 